Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you all for joining us on, this, on our, your Sunday. <laughs> I hope everyone's having an awesome weekend. Uh, and thank you for everyone who is tuning in live. Uh, this is the CSC's panel discussion on virtual production, which, as I'm sure most of you is most of you are aware, is something that's everyone is talking about right now. Um, it's funny in the experience of collecting all you guys and putting this panel together. Uh, I think a lot of people have put this technology on their radar. So I'm so happy that all of you could join in and share your personal experience with working with virtual production and giving an introduction to everyone on the call and everyone who's streaming live, uh, what virtual production is. So to introduce you guys, we have some awesome panelists. Um, we've got Brendan Taylor, who is the founder and VFX supervisor at Mavericks. Um, Jeremy Benning, obviously a CSC member. Um, we've got Amir Andala, who is the founder and CEO of The Other End. We've got David Dexter, who's the director at CERT. Obviously myself, Carl Janice, uh, and we've got Yesamin, uh, who is an amazing director who has awesome experience working with this technology. Um, what I want to show to all of you first is a quick demo, an overview. Oh, and Spencer. <laughs> hey, Spencer. <laughs> we've got Spencer over at CERT as well. Um, so Spencer and I put together a little demo for everyone uh, to showcase what virtual production is like on an LED volume stage, which is set up at CERT right now. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off with a little demo video to give you guys an overview of what it's like to shoot in a virtual production environment. Looks good, go ahead. Want to bring the sound up, Carl? Um, we're actually in a sound stage, and you can see we have a bunch of equipment, a lot of GAC around here. We got foreground elements in addition to our virtual environment on our LED screens. In order to really understand how that comes together, I think the best thing would be to look at it through the Alexa and deconstruct our, our lighting. So when we're looking through the Alexa, we can start to turn down our physical lights. Why don't we do that with our fill light in the back there? Cool, let's bring down our backlight as well. And our image 87 key light. Awesome. We can see things don't match at all. That's not really that great. Um, the other thing we could do is uh, modify our virtual background in the background. So yeah, bring up all our lighting again. There we go. And you know, let's play with the lighting intensity, the exposure on our virtual camera. Well, that's terrible. Okay, so yeah, let's bring that way, way down. Yeah, maybe for a night scene. Actually, let's just keep it at what kind of what it was. That's that's what we crafted. We also have Unreal lighting. We can modify that virtual lighting. So if Matt uh, ramps the sun, we can change where our sun is positioned in that virtual environment. Now, obviously, we'd have to make on-set physical adjustments to match where that virtual sun is. But the fact that we can control it at the flick of a switch, or rather a rotation of a dial, is, uh, is pretty amazing for virtual production. Awesome. Cool. And we can also, uh, maybe we needed to make sort of a fine adjustment, adjust the translation or rotation of our virtual camera. So let's tweak that a little bit, Matt. So we were able to control that virtual wall rotation of the virtual camera, uh, we can actually see how, what that looks like in this wide shot uh, when Kevin moves his physical camera we can see this inner camera frustrum. So this is the little window that we're rendering. And maybe Matt make that super tiny. And so we can see what's happening in, in camera there. If we wanted to match up, we'd have to go on a much longer lens in order to you know, get that tight field of view, or we can just increase our render frustrum and cover that sensor. 
If we are actually moving our physical camera in this environment, we have to track its position. That's sort of that last component you need to sell this sort of illusion. We need to know how the camera is rotating and where its position is in this entire space. We do that with our motion capture system. So you can see these little blue lights probably way over there in the corner. Those are mocap cameras, and they're reflecting off of little markers on our, on our physical camera that we can track. That's sort of how we are able to know where our physical camera is in relation to this virtual environment. And then as we move our, our camera, the background will update and, and distort and stretch and give us the right perspective based on where that physical camera is. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed our short, short virtual production scene. I uh, hope you were able to learn a little bit about what goes into sort of crafting a, a virtual production shot. Uh, thanks so much to our virtual production team here, Kevin Santos, Matt, and Emerson, and of course, Vanna being our talent. Um, if you want to learn more about virtual production and you know work with academic researchers who are interested in problem solving and development of workflow, feel free to get in touch with the CERT Center. Thanks so much. Okay, so virtual production. Um, I think it's become this amazing blanket term which covers everything from real-time game engine previs to onset LED wall volumetric capture like what you saw there. Um, Spencer and I spent the day yesterday putting together that little demo for everyone on this call because while I think we've all spent time now viewing behind the scenes of the Mandalorian, you know, seeing this shiny silver suit walk around stage and all this huge LED volume, I know in my personal experience it was eye-opening to see all the different elements that came into play once you first actually stepped on that stage and had to work in that environment and blend basically a virtual scene with a physical scene. So first up, I actually want to open the conversation with Spencer and David at CERT. And I want to ask you guys, knowing CERT's background being a research and development team, you guys have been involved in motion capture and virtual reality, augmented reality, any new technology, I know I've come to demos there with Sony Venices and Technocranes. When did virtual production, you know, get on your radar? And why did you guys decide to build this LED volume stage? Thanks, Carl. Um, it, it's been interesting, the, 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 the development of virtual production over the years. And I think, um, you know, we've seen some of the leaders uh, Cameron and that starting to work with it 10 years ago in, in this form of pre-vis. And we, uh, 10 years ago, we actually bought our first solid track camera with a PC uh, to do camera tracking in that. And just recently, we see the, the mass evolution of it because the technology is more stable, the, the, the technology is more feature rich. Um, and it is combining kind of what, what, you, what you've said is a lot of different pieces of the technology, just pure technology layer integration, and then the development of workflow. And then finally, you know, the, you know, the DPs and the full teams getting together and starting to shoot, starting to try, you know, the different ways um, to bring uh, virtual production and both from an LED screen to a green screen together. Um, and then and having access to someone like our stage and, and my team and really starting to realize the benefits of it within content development. And that last part is important um, because, you know, a couple of years ago, the, the cost to entry was pretty high and it's now rapidly, rapidly coming down, um, especially with the game engines, uh, with Unreal sort of leading the way, but Unity also is building their virtual production tool set and gives the ability, you know, also to have the uh, chipset, um, be it NVIDIA's uh, GPU combined with an AMD CPU to actually start setting up and doing a lot of work in, in, in the home office, as we say, or the home studio and being able to now start to develop all of this. So we're in a very fortunate position being in CERT because our goal is to help industry evolve with access to technology, access to people who understand the technology, and then just access to just come on in and we'll just try to figure it out. And, uh, and uh, being government funded and the ability to, to help with lowering the cost to the figuring out part to see, you know, use it for your next content piece um, is, is been fantastic and the support both provincially and federally around that is, 
has been fantastic. And then I've seen the evolution. I'll pass it over to Spence, but you know, we've Spence came in as a motion capture lead and and now you know we've got a team that he's running of five uh, folks under our virtual production team and and we're busy so spence you want to add layer on some uh, some wisdom to the question yeah for sure um i mean as a technical artist and researcher i really started to be sort of really aware of of virtual production as a tool set um when real-time renderers really became easily accessible by sort of the masses. So, you know, when Epic Games um, launched Unreal Engine for like for free to, to use and learn and, and Unity as well, you could start to, to really explore those tools. Um, you know, as David mentioned, we, our background sort of started on the digital cinema side and then also sort of motion capture for previs. And at the time we were strictly using, you know, Motion Builder, Autodesk Motion Builder for pre-visualization to plan out shots, you know, with motion, motion capture actors. Um, but once these game engines starting to be, started to be more accessible and once we realized you could bring all that performance data into these real-time renders, then there was sort of a really rapid uh, uh, compression of advancement in, in the software and, and you could get a lot of interesting visuals out of these real-time game engines. So that's when we really started thinking about using virtual production workflows. Awesome. And so um, just one more question to you, Spencer, knowing that like you're kind of the virtual production lead at CERT and you've helped build out this stage. Um, can you speak to like the, the growth process there? Like how did, how did you get into this first and what, what technology did we see at play? So for everyone at home that's interested in working with this, like what's kind of the learning curve for you mm -hmm. getting into this? Yeah, I mean, there's different, like virtual production is sort of like, from my perspective, there's a, a higher level category and, and beneath that is subcategories of virtual production. There's there's stuff that is completely virtual that you can just do with full virtual cameras in the engine. Uh, or then there's these in-camera VFX. So that's using physical props, live action actors, and that's sort of the Mandalorian stuff that we're seeing. So there's, there's definitely two different focus areas for virtual production. Um, and we sort of touched all of it as, as the CERT Center. And you know, the technologies, the core technology areas that are sort of required to accomplish, you know, in parts, both of those workflows, you know, relate to um, rendering capability. So your actual GPU hardware, um, the workstation that you're, that you're using, you need to be able to power uh, all these experiences. Um, then there's the tracking component. If you are doing sort of the in-camera VFX and also the fully virtual stuff, you need some sort of way to uh, record and keep track of the device you're using, your, your camera, whether it's virtual or physical camera and a combination of the two. Um, and then obviously in sort of an environment like Mandalorian or this, this in-camera VFX, then you need some, some displays, large format displays. So that's LED walls of some kind. And there's all kinds of makes and, and types of those kinds of solutions. Uh, and then I guess the, the assets. So what's that, what are you actually rendering? What are you putting on screen? What does the creative look like? So those are sort of the four main sort of components that you would require to sort of get into these different areas. Awesome, thank you. Carl, I can, sorry, Carl, I can play a quick video that shows a little bit of our history. Absolutely, yeah, go for it. Yeah, we got it because you'll, you'll see and I'll just talk over while, while I share it here because, um, so. So at the, at the beginning, you're gonna see a green screen here. So you're gonna see the evolution of virtual production from a CERT perspective and sort of the folks that we've, we've worked with. Um, two years ago, we did a, a major project with one of the chip manufacturers. And that's how this started out with just pure green screen plus motion capture plus virtual cameras and, and, uh, vir and virtual lighting. Um, this is something even pre Unreal Virtual uh, Toolkit. So um, it's, we've been working on this for a while and the idea is, you know, as technology gets released, as plugins get released, we can work on the next, the next layer that's happening. And we're going to see some really exciting stuff on the integration of what comes into uh, the environment virtually. Um, we're working on digital humans. So this fight scene was two years ago that we were able to engage with uh, and produce that to, I would probably say, 70% final pixels. And that was two years ago. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I love that you guys both brought up um, the fact that virtual production, as we all know it, uh, didn't just start when LED walls entered sound stages. Um, 
virtual production, I think, is being tossed around quite often now because we're seeing behind the scenes of The Mandalorian and we're seeing lots of media be put out there around the idea that there's LED volumetric stages. Um, but actually, I want to toss it over to Brendan and Jeremy because you guys have been using virtual production tools and real-time capture um, in both your work processes for a while now. Uh, and so I'm going to kick that off by uh, tossing up a little video of Jeremy uh, dancing around a virtual stage uh, with a virtual camera. I'll let Brendan speak to this because this is actually at his facility at, at Mavericks. VFR. Yeah, so what, what you're going to see is Jeremy actually in our screening room that has been converted into a virtual production stage very, very quickly by moving the stairs out or the chairs out. Um, basically what you're seeing is we, we created just a really silly short film with a bunch of zombies um, and created this whole environment um, using something called mega scans and brushify to very quickly create a digital environment. And, um, and we put some humans in and some zombies in and what you're seeing Jeremy doing right now is um, that that camera is a virtual camera and he's, he's, in the virtual environment panning around very easy for him to change lenses um and, and and basically come up with whatever he wants to come up with this particular shot you're seeing right now you know we saw this helicopter flying all over the place and jeremy's like i don't suppose it's possible you can put me on the wing of that helicopter I'm like sure why not so it just through you know the virtue of playing around and indulging our own curiosity um we were able to come up with this that, that looks I mean, this is previs, right? And it looks pretty darn good. You get some like really great reflections on the side and motion blur on the helicopter rotors. Um, it's front lit. I'm sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> we could have changed that. Um, and we could have changed it. We could have just easily moved the sun around. So we just did that and a couple little effects and the helicopter lands and, and everything. But um, the idea for us doing this particular scene at this point was... Um, but so I got into this in June um, and I called Jeremy right away as soon as I sort of was like, we're going to do this. And uh, he was totally gung ho. For those of you who don't know Jeremy, he's a very technical guy and loves to get his get right in there. Um, and we just created a scene um, to to start playing around with. And I wanted to go as far as previs, maybe a little bit of actually uh, we can do on like onset um, uh, uh, visualization as well, but I didn't want to go as far as the LED screens because we just didn't have the capital to be able to do that. It's a big setup, um, but I wanted to, what we really wanted to use it for was a collaboration tool, totally influenced by COVID hundred percent. How do we scout locations as a film crew together when we can't be in a van for eight hours a day? How do we, you know, how do we, we're limited to 10 hours a day on a lot of these shoots. How do we get as efficient as possible, know exactly what we need to do, um, but not being, not allowed to be in the same room. So we devised this to be something that can be done over Zoom. And we've been using it over, you know, a few productions um, to, you know, directors are in quarantine. They want to start pre -vising. They want to look around the locations they can't they come to us and we can walk around with them through the locations to plan stuff out. That's basically how we, we started using it. And then, you know, Jeremy's been amazing just helping us out by telling us what a cinematographer needs when they step on the stage with us. Cause we're, you know, we know some of this stuff, but like it, I want it to be as seamless as possible. So they're using all the same tools. We still, we will follow focus, exactly the same as, as a first AC would use on set. We have um, wheels so that you can control it the way that you control a camera um, a crane. We've got a handheld rig, but the important thing for us was to get it um, as close to the actual, um, the actual tools and processes that you use when you're on set. And I, I, think, I think for me, like it was interesting how at the same time I was, you know, reading into Unreal and getting like blown away by what I was seeing and thinking like, how do we use this as a previous tool? And then Brendan called me like by coincidence around the same time back in the summer and said, Hey, we're working on this, this thing. And, and when I went in and saw it for the first time, I think what blew me away was how 
instantaneous. The, there was like no latency. So, you know, when I put the camera on my shoulder and that helicopter shot, for example, like Paul, his, um, his operator of the, of the unreal system, I kind of realized he's kind of like your dolly grip. So I could say, Oh, can you put me like, put me here. And that when that idea of the helicopter came up, they had basically already created that whole scene. So the zombies running the helicopter landing, there's a plane flying over that was already kind of created. So it was kind of like they had done the blocking. So I basically showed up and kind of stood back in VR and watched this scene happen. And okay, everything's already been like programmed. So I'm just watching the blocking and now it's okay. Like, where do we put the camera? So when I saw that the helicopter was coming in, I said, well, what if we put the camera on the, like in the helicopter looking out and we're, we're with the helicopter as it lands and what was great is I thought, well, it just needs a little bit of shake. I need to like shake oh, yeah. the camera to, to you know, because it's so smooth because it's a, you know, obviously I'm not on a real helicopter. But what was amazing is that little bit of shake I was adding just by what you would do, like when you're operating a real camera to, to add like the sense of motion, it was doing it exactly as I was doing it. So all the motion was was there, um, you know, and then we were playing with like, what if we had a crane shot and we're craning down as the zombies come in and we meet the soldiers as they're coming in. And we basically were just, you know, picking spots in space, like with Paul saying, okay, the camera's going to start up here and wants to end here. This is the line that it travels. And I'm going to sit on the wheels and operate it like I would and watch it happen. Then, okay, we're not fast enough. Okay, next time, Paul, go, you go faster on the move. I'll pan and tilt faster. And then I realized how amazing this was to, to you know, come up with an idea for a, a shot. You can plan the whole thing out in a way that you couldn't do or, or the time you would save if that had to then be a location shoot. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was impressed with, with it right away. And the, the other thing, remember, Jeremy, when we were we were doing that, we had another scene that was like a rooftop and it was raining in the nighttime. And we were yep. just playing around with like helicopter shots. Uh, we would fly the helicopter. And uh, there was a moment where all of us were like, whoa, did you just see that? Because we've got real, like we got physically based rain and physically based lighting. As yeah. we were going up to the rooftop, it, it backlit the, a sheet of rain and it just gave this like crazy sheen that we flew through. <laughs> And, you know, as a visual effects supervisor, if you're doing that as a full CG scene, you, you wouldn't think to put that in. I mean, some people would, I wouldn't. Um, it's the only those, those accidents that you get, you know, and, and it helps you to get away from the cleanliness of, of the full CG because full CG is everything that's in your mind, you're trying to create it. But what you can get in a game engine like this is these happy accidents. Like, and things that you just think up on on the spot and you get real-time feedback on it, which is for me, one of the most exciting parts. Like I had never thought that we could be using this as a, like intense design as well. And that's what we were doing. I mean, with designing the shots, sure. But we, you get things that you would never even think of. And that's for me, like, like exhilarating because you're, we're all, we're just in a room. We're in that, that screening room and, and, and you get really, really into it. Like, Everybody who is in there, you can see this aha moment. And I've had, I don't know, since going through this, maybe about 50 aha moments as you just uncover something. There's a question that came in from Cody, actually, uh, Brendan, that's yeah. uh, he's asking if, if after you've done the previs camera move, if you decide to change the lighting afterwards, could you basically take what you've shot virtually and then change the lighting later? Yeah, excellent question. So that's the really cool part. I will, I will go back a couple steps and, and tell you, what our previs, like our visual effects previs process is. You know, we get a download from the director and then we interpret it and then we download that to our artists. They do, do some stuff, we go back and forth with them and then they render out what they've done and we put it into the cut and we send it off to the director. In this process, um, the director's there with us so we're playing around with it. But what you're getting in an Unreal session like this is you get, it records position, rotation, and transformation. So that's, that's it. So where is this camera in 3D space is basically the only thing that's sort of locked in stone. And then if you wanna change the, that nighttime scene to make it a daytime scene, you can keep all the camera work that you've already done. You can move lights around, like for the zombie scene, we could have made that a, a nighttime scene really easily, just made it, made it night and then moved, put in lights, and we would have kept all the work that we had done. So it is, um, you know, it's not, it's a non-destructive workflow. It's been, it's a great question. So, you know, you had and a also, session. And also, and what was great too is that we could, you know, I could say, 
hey, can we see this on a 35 mil now? Like we saw the 25 or the 18, let's see the yeah. 25. And then Paul would just click, click. Okay, now you're looking at a 35 and it's the same. And I could say, can I see it at a, at a two? I want to see if I focus to this person in the foreground, how shallow will the background be? And yeah. I could see it happening all in real time, which I, but blew me away that it was that, like it was the way I would think that a 35 mil looks like when you're focused two feet away. Yeah, and, and one thing that we've done, Jeremy, that you haven't seen yet is we've actually are taking the lens grids and trying to mimic you know, a specific lens and the characteristics of a specific lens. So if a production gives us, you know, lens grids for a cook, cook lenses, then we, we match the chromatic aberration and the distortion and all that. So if you're a DP players. who knows their lenses, um, hopefully we've done our job well <laughs> and, you, and you'll be able to feel it. I'd like to do a really quick screen share because it, it relates to what Jeremy was saying. Is that, is that cool? Please. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Um, all right. So can we all see this? All right, yep. I, yeah, I can see it. Okay, sorry, I'm just gonna move you guys over. All right. So here's our camera. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about what I built here. Where are we? Oh, we are far, hold on. That is strange. Okay, sorry. Somehow. All right. So what I what I wanted to do with this actual process of what, what we've done here is I wanted to create a real location. And I wanted uh, and the, the task that I gave um, our artists, we had two artists on this was create me a real location based only on Google Earth and images you found on the Internet. What a strange thing to ask people to do. But the reason is, is that this is a location I have been to. This is Cape Campbell, New Zealand. And I actually scouted this in 2014 with, uh, for a movie called The Light Between Oceans uh, with DreamWorks. And I wanted, and we scouted it for about two and a half weeks, driving all around New Zealand. It was really fun. And I'm glad I got to do it, but it's also expensive. You know, you fly 10 people over from, uh, from North America and, you know, business class flights because we're fancy people, right? And it can, it can end up being quite an expensive venture. What I wanted them, what I wanted our artists to do is to recreate this as best we can in a short amount of time for as little money as possible. Um, is It's not as good as, you know, the boots on the ground actually walking around. I understand that, but you get a lot from it. I mean, here it is. Um, we can say, one of the things we knew we wanted to do was have Michael Fassbender come out of a door right here and be backlit by the sun. So um, here, we'll just move that. So we are, we had, um, was that September 21st was the date. We can change it to October 21st if we want. And then we can actually go There we go. That's so cool. So there's the sun right there. So we know that at around, you know, 7.30, 7.30, we gotta be up there to get Michael Fassbender being uh, backlit by a sunset. And it's all geolocated. So this is exactly how it is. And if you watch the movie, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> that's probably exactly what time we shot it at. Um, but you can, you know, look, we can go around, we can, um, we can move quickly, we can make shots, you can change the lens, uh, change the time of day. And if we had this ability when we were in pre-production, like I think we looked at maybe a dozen different uh, lighthouses. If we had this ability when we, were, when we were scouting, we could have said, no, we're pretty sure it's w one of these three. Uh, it's such a beautiful location. Anyway, so, that was one of the big things for us too, was, was a, a, the ability to scout shot plan and all that. Okay, like that is amazing. To share. <laughs> that is super cool. And what I love about that story is it, it shows that um, these are tools because you just queued that up on your laptop. These are tools that sort of, instead of making um, film more exclusive and like you feel as though you require more money to get the bigger shots, you're able to go scout a virtual location in New Zealand um, 
from your house or your studio, which is amazing. And so I'm gonna actually use that as a launch point to bring Amir into the conversation because Amir, you are a producer, you've produced independent films, commercials, and I love that you approach this from the perspective of, you know, let's not um, be the Mandalorian or be this big Hollywood production, but how can these tools be used for independent cinema? How can these tools be used for independent production? So what I'm going to do is play a little demo that you shared with me. And if you're able to uh, just walk us through what we're looking at. Sure. Uh, looks, looks good. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. yeah. So basically what we started uh, back in late 2019 was sort of like everybody else who were blown away by what Disney's The Mandalorian guys did. And then we immediately recognized the implication of virtual production and what presents for the future of indie film industry. That's why we decided to sort of invest in the team and the workflow to do that. Basically, we believed that a lot of stuff that we saw in that reel was dream for indie filmmakers because they don't have like Brendan was saying they don't have the budget to fly 10 people in business class elsewhere they don't have the budget to have this you know unlimited sort of resources at, at their disposal and as you can see here we, we decided to showcase different locations and setups and at this test that we did uh, how could we actually go around in eight different locations without moving units, without being uh, stuck at the whole insurance issues and having people who are on specifically during the you know, pandemic, like everything was shut down. So that's where we started thinking about developing our own workflow um, sort of uh, with uh, three things in mind. First of all, how could we make it affordable? Uh, so, you know, for the indie productions so they could actually dream and how could it be accessible and scalable? Depends on the projects that we're gonna do from smaller production house, uh, uh, production shoot all the way to uh, maybe a little bigger feature film. Uh, and well, uh, obviously, unfortunately the pandemic happened and uh, we had some time on our hand because most of the other projects just kind of went on pause. Uh, luckily we had David Spencer in the third encouraging us, pushing this through, and uh, we managed to pull together this uh, test, which was, to, to our knowledge at the time, was the only uh, basically full cycle of the workflow of, from ideation to execution. There is no Bible, and I think today there wasn't, uh, I don't think there's a Bible, so we're still trying, we're still creating R&Ds and uh, improving our workflow. Uh, it was definitely a massive learning curve for us. Uh, immediately, we knew that we had to change our mindset because we always had this idea that like looking at things differently, break down the scene in a completely different setup. Producing was indie film was completely different. And we never had the minds. We never considered like having uh, like Brandon and his team on a project to just, you know, do previous. We don't really have the budget that. And then all of a sudden Unreal gave us an opportunity to have the previous and set on real time. And it was amazing. Uh, it was also uh, sort of a full team effort. I believe the one thing we learned was uh, the fact that VFX is now in every step of filmmaking. You have to think about it when you even develop the film, develop the story. Uh, obviously, you know, we had to master our capabilities of technology. I think one of the things that's happening right now on set specifically for indie film uh, production is the fact that people are using a lot of computing and tech lingo that we didn't use to. We didn't know that. So we all have to learn about how things work. We, we were like uh, basically looking at things completely differently. So the idea was to create this hyper-realistic imagery for indie filmmakers that they're used to shoot their films on real locations. They don't believe in like going somewhere and do CG. They don't believe in that. They, they, they think, I, I believe that. I believe that technology won't bring the authenticity to the set. But at the same time, we thought, sure, why don't we give it a shot? And uh, as you could see in our reel, we managed to pull it off, I guess, at least to a certain extent within the budget that we had. And one more thing on the set I just wanted to add was we tried, I think, eight or nine different locations within four days of shoot. So to show that how we could actually 
uh, do this process, how quick it could be, and what would be the impact on the duration of principal shooting days on a, on a production at that level. That's Amir, it's, it's really amazing stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's Appreciate really that. good. And um, just a, a question, maybe speaking to any uh, independent directors or producers out there that are, you know, maybe working more with a uh, uh, telefilm level budget, um, something outside the realm of getting a big studio on board. Um, how do you ap approach a project now with virtual production in mind? Like, how do you approach the creative and see how that fits into the, the pipeline and the workflow? Well, basically, mm -hmm. It's kind of too early to say that. Like, uh, uh, I, I think getting to that point requires a lot of experience, a lot of tests, a lot of R&Ds. Uh, obviously, the aim is to have a turnkey virtual production solution and services to offer to these type of productions. We believe there will be a bigger market apart from those big studios that we're investing very soon. Now, the world is going towards watching content in a variety of different platforms and uh, we believe that this is going to be a, one of the very interesting ways of producing these type of uh, concepts. In order to get that, we're very much focusing on our workflow. Uh, we're still like with David, the team, we're designing R&Ds to try different ways of doing things, which I think it's essential to do that. Uh, this is also based on the challenges we had, particularly with our experience. I think. We, we will definitely very soon need a database of other indie filmmakers and producers that are trying these things because it's really hard to come up with one way of doing any project in, in virtual production. I, I guess we all know that, that this is very, very much dependent on the idea and the, the situation independently, and it could vary from one project to another. Awesome. Um, and I, I think you touched on something really important there. Uh, and actually, I'll speak to my experience even even starting to put this panel together and, and the many forms it took because, um, you know, a bit of my background and, and my side hustle is is trying to provide film education online um, for people through my company, Pocket Film School. And, and my first iteration of this was like, oh, it would be very natural to workshop this. Let's let's teach people how to use this technology. And then um, to everyone out there tuning in, I, I very quickly ran into this uh, this sort of, not wall, but this this barrier where it's like, oh, there's there's not a set way of doing things yet. Um, there is no set formula for how um, things are created. Uh, and we're all sort of using, you know, garage technology to throw this together. Um, and so I'll use that opportunity to actually throw it over to Yesamin because I know um, you know, the rest of us, <laughs> very funny, uh, are the, the sort of glasses wearing uh, more technically oriented individuals. <laughs> Everyone takes their glasses off. Um, but, you know, yourself as a director, you had an opportunity to uh, work with a virtual production stage firsthand for a live performance video for a piece that you shot for Disney. Um, so I'm going to cue that up. I'm going to cue up that little demo. You can walk us through what we're looking at and a bit of your experience in creating this piece. And... Um, yeah, for sure. So uh, I guess the video what you guys are watching right now is a live performance video that we did for an artist named Ren and it was for uh, the Disney movie Clouds. Um, so essentially the concept of the video was just to create sort of a virtual production environment where the sky was kind of going from day to night um, as she was performing, uh, like performing the track with the guitar. Um, in terms of like an, the ideation process, I think what was interesting and different from what I've worked with before is um, even from the start with the ideation process, uh, the CERT team like Spencer and Dave, they're with us right from the get go. So it was sort of, I had, there was an idea of doing something from like going from day to night and we would talk to Dave um, as well as Spencer to see kind of within virtual production, what the te technical capabilities were. And then from there, that kind of sort of also, you know, there's sort of like a back and forth, like that kind of informed the ideation process as well. So like what ideas could we do um, in virtual production that were technically possible? Um, and I think what's really cool too about like work, working with virtual production, just coming from someone like I, 
my style tends to be a bit more practical, um, shooting in like real locations and things like that. So kind of switching and rewiring to, to figuring out shots and blocking and things like that and composition in virtual production versus a, a practical environment was really different. So it's like, instead of going into a house and being like, okay, hey, I wanna shoot this person like between the store frame, it's like, instead of virtual production, it's like, no, you can, you can build that stuff from like the ground up. So it's like, you can like, I can like go to Spencer and be like, this is, this is the architecture that I want. So it's like, instead of using existing architecture that's at a location, it's like, you're, you're sort of like the architect, architect, I guess, like of your set. Like I can go to Spencer and be like, oh, can we just have like flowers falling in the sky for no reason? <laughs> and Spencer's like, yeah, we can do that. Um, so that process is really cool because it is very, it is very, very collaborative in a sense, like um, before that video, we had prep and Spencer and I spent a couple of late nights <laughs> trying to get this like customized sky thing going um, and like having all those like queue up to like the track um, from like beginning to end and like make it fit and all that kind of stuff. Like musically, what I mean is make it fit. Um, so yeah, I think, um, it's cool because I think the idea that the way that the workflow and the way that you think about how things fit together is a bit different, a lot different, I think, than when you're shooting something practically. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, um, can you speak to a bit of that experience going through the ideation phase when you're coming up for this, uh, live performance video? Like, how did you... How did you land where you landed? How did you land on that that virtual set? Yeah, um, I, sh I should also speak to in terms of like specifically for short form content too. Like I think um, like compared to say like more longer form content where you probably have a lot more prep time as well. Um, with short form content, you know, you kind of have to deliver pretty quickly because, you know, Disney wants to have this now. <laughs> you know? um, so in terms of like the prep phase too, it was sort of... Um, working with like within like what was what was possible within like a short amount of time um but I think in terms of the, so it, because we were kind of working with what was possible within a short amount of time I think like within the ideation process it was like um like we would have these like crazy ideas like can we do this and then Spencer and Day would be like yes we can or like no nah, that we can't really do that <laughs> like a short amount of time so I guess um, like in terms of that, like the idea sort of was like sculpted kind of like, it was really like a back and forth uh, between like how we like sculpted the, the final project or the final product in the end. Yeah, one thing I noticed in working uh, on that project was that it was very iterative, right? And that also lent, that worked out well with just like the type of content it was, it was, meant to be a live performance thing. So there was this process of like, you know, it's starting, we're going through the whole song and then it's ending and it all needs to be sort of one take. So there's this process of rehearsal with like the practical elements in terms of the steady cam op and, and then hitting those lighting cues and triggering sort of effects. And that was sort of like a start to end process. And then once we had that, then we could start to iterate on it and build on off of that and make it better you know, take this away, add that, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, it was nice, nice to see everything sort of real time because you could, uh, yeah, just like add elements as you, you know, continue the process. Yeah, it was interesting working in that environment sort of in sort of like a one take sort of thing too, because there was a lot of choreography between like Spencer, who's manually queuing up the changes in the environment with like the DP Dennis, who was, you know, uh, timing out like the lighting cues so that the light that was on the subject run and the practical elements sort of blended blended seamlessly with the environment. Um, and then also cueing sort of like practical elements that we had uh, to add sort of like foreground with the back to in addition to the background. Um, so like as an example, when the flowers fell in the virtual background, we had people standing on ladders on either side sort of like dropping flower petals to sort of add a foreground element to the shot. Um, so like even on shoot day, I feel like a lot of the day was actually spent choreographing and rehearsing all of those cues before we even actually shot the one take. So it was a, maybe a different way of using a virtual production environment. But yes, I mean, and Spence, um, start to finish when, when did the ideation start and then how long did it take? And when did you finish like from number of days kind of thing? 
I think it was like a five day process. I think it was yeah. like, <laughs> like Friday that we were, they were building you the really concept. Yeah. And then we did like, I, I did some prep over the weekend and then like Monday to Thursday was our rehearsal and crafting phase. And then we did the, the shoot on the Friday. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that's important. And I think Carl, that when you asked before, I think the speed now of learning virtual production, at least to a certain degree, is is being shortened. And then, you know, if you gave gave these guys, you know, another three weeks, you know, from ideation, then it would that iterative process would be uh, even more. Yeah, and it sort of ties back into some of the things that Namir was saying. Is like throughout this whole week, we were like noting down, or at least I was in terms of like oh, this is something we should have as a feature, like on the next thing. Like I, I knew like there was things that we were hitting that were like, well, we want control over this. We want to be able to make this part of the workflow faster. And you don't have necessarily have time on set to, you know, bring on a developer and solve that problem immediately. You just like find a workaround and a hack to, just to get the shot done. Um, but then, you know, after production wraps, you know, there's this nice, you know, debrief process where you can be like, okay, well, this is a feature we, we need. We need to be able to, to really control the sun and put it anywhere and have full control over the density of the clouds and, you know, how, how quickly they're moving and that kind of thing. Right? Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting thing with virtual production too, is because it's, it is a very new technology. So um, a lot of, you know, a lot of productions, like everything is new. It's a lot of testing and learning. There's probably a lot of things that people haven't tried already in virtual production that's possible. Um, a lot of other parameters that, you know, we didn't have time to, you know, test that like we could have, you know, done more customization on. So um, I think that's the the cool thing about virtual production is like, we don't even really know what like is everything that's possible within, within uh, that technology yet. Yeah, we'll say one. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, sorry, we, gonna... We've been we've been experiencing the same thing. It's just it's so powerful, and there's so many different things that you can do. Um, but th because there's no out of the box solution, each one, each little customization, you need to do yourself, and someone needs to have that in their brain about how it actually works. So it, it ends up being the spider web of of different customizable pieces. And also how they like intersect because we find you like figure out a solution for one thing and then that works, but then it like might interfere with a different aspect of, uh, of your, your thing. And you're like, oh, we can't use these together in this way. And it's uh, they need to be aware of each other. Yeah, like trying to put a fitted sheet that's too small for the bed, like, okay, three corners and pop, and it'll fall apart. <laughs> um, awesome. We've got a couple of questions coming in. And uh, now that everyone has given a bit of their, their backstory in this crazy world of VP, um, I'd love to toss it out to the room and anyone just sort of pick it up uh, if you've got an answer. Um, first one that's come up a few times is, uh, is anyone or has anyone used LiDAR technology to create their environment? So obviously that's, that's using uh, laser depth scanning to try and build out an environment uh, for themselves. Has anyone uh, had a chance to use that? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a big part of our virtual production uh, workflow at Mavericks. Um, we, I'll, I'll take it back a bit um, because as you remember, I, I had talked about, um, this was COVID related and we were talking about location scouts. So what we started with was actually a program called Matterport, which is chiefly used for um, real estate. And you go in and, and they have a, their, their own little LIDAR camera that only works indoors and doesn't work outdoors. But they just created functionality where you can use a Leica BLK360 LiDAR scanner. And um, I, I'll, I'll do a screen share really quick to, to show you what we did with that. But basically, you can go out and get someone to go scan a location. And then when they get home, they can upload it to the Matterport site. And then you can actually get you know, a version of a 3D environment. So we would do that. We would send someone out and then... I've been using the example of a train station. You want to try three different, you want to try one in Hamilton, one in Toronto and, you know, one in Barrie. So you go scan all those three and then, you know, the next day you can show them to the art department. The art department can actually walk through them, you know? Um, and then they say, okay, well, we want the one in Toronto. And then we would take that and you could download the LIDAR data and then you build the environment based off of that. And then, so I'll show you, um, I'll, I'll just share my screen again. Um, this is uh, 
Toronto Street, which people who shoot in Toronto will know because it always doubles for New York or Chicago. But, um, and we're not very good at naming streets in this city apparently. Um, but yeah, we built this all off of, uh, off of the LIDAR. LIDAR and still photos and, you know, you can get pretty close up to it. But um, this is exactly the dimensions of, of Toronto Street. So you can get up quite high. I think what's great about this, and this is something that Brendan and I were kind of like realizing and talking about when we were playing with this stuff was that, you know, for example, like you see the green screen there, you know, the question always is, you know, what, how much green screen do you need? You know, you, here's the shot, it's a crane shot. And you've got this task of like, we have to send the grips in in advance and build this big rig for green or blue screen. Mm -hmm. And it's always that question of like, well, how much is enough and how much can we get away with? And this tool is such a great way of really knowing uh, what your shot is and, and seeing how much green screen do you physically need. You can now measure, you can make it in this world and then and then reverse engineer how big it is and where it needs to go. And, and same with, if you're doing a set piece, it's like combination in a studio, you have to build a set piece that's partially a real thing that's been with blue screen around it. And you've got say a crane shot and you wanna move the crane into that environment. It's like, well, will the crane shot that we've designed fit in the studio? Cause is, is the, will the stage height allow it? And will the, um, you know, will the platform or whatever we're making be high enough to get the camera move mm -hmm. in the right place as far as a set piece. So this is for me, like this previous thing is a great way of answering those questions, uh, you know, photographically. Yeah, and talking and talking about customizability, you know, um, we will we will create or we have created uh, limits to things like you cannot, you know, if you're working on, uh, you know, you cr you create a limit such as you can only go up on a 50 foot techno, like you can't do a shot that starts at 75 feet. It, it there the, has a ceiling of 50 feet, and you can only do what the arm will allow you to do, which because you know anyone who's been involved in previs is every once in a while, you'll create something that you actually can't even film real without, you know, burning through your budget. So we can create, you know, different limits so that we're not creating something that is unachievable, which has been really interesting in terms of uh, a previous approach. That was cool, actually, Brennan, how you were moving around the streetlights and showing the yeah. with it. Yeah, and it's just like a real-time thing, right? And, you know, on other shows we've been working on, we've we've had them with, uh, you know, VR goggles and moving entire buildings around, right? Like, it's it's been pretty fun. But, we, you well, know, you can do all that and you can work with production design department as well so that you're all on the same page, move you know, well in pre-production. It's pretty fun. I thought it was cool that once you taught me how to use the, the VR controllers, I was able to actually fly myself around in one of those environments and actually find vantage points by just literally like levitating myself around in the space, which was yeah. pretty, pretty cool. That is very fun. If anybody wants to come over and try it, it's really fun. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Um, another question we're getting from our audience, and, and we can sort of uh, uh, plug all this together. So looking at that previs, LiDAR scanning, um, when you bring that into real world biz, so bring that on set, um, a question that's come up a few times now is essentially, how do you shoot a wide shot in this environment? The specific question is, you know, can you shoot a wide, a wide shot on the screen and then green screen the floor and put that in later? Um, but I'll also sort of twist that and say, you know, the demo that we played at the beginning uh, was specifically shot on a 55 mil. And the reason why we did that, just to, you know, peel behind the curtain, is uh, it just makes things easier because not to go into the backstory of why we had one demo and then we had to switch to the other at the, the last minute, but the tighter you get, the easier it is to shoot on those volumes. Um, but does anyone, ha can anyone speak to um, solutions for basically shooting off your set? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's some interesting ideas and things you can test and you threw one out there is, is you know, yeah, why can't you have one of these LED volumes and then extend the, the, the set with a, with a green screen or, or just, you know, through traditional visual effects approaches. Like that's, that's certainly things that you can take and or approaches you can take, but you just, you know, need to share, need to make sure that you're like setting up your, your shots to support those like sort of post-production workflows. Um, you know, 
hardware is 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 a really easy answer and maybe unfair because it's you know based on sort of cost and resources um if you can have a full you know wrap around with enough screen screen ceiling height um or sorry not necessarily a screen ceiling but just enough wall height then you could have a, certainly do a wide enough shot um the wide shot actually starts to where like what's really critical on those shots is your practical elements. So your physical, your physical floor, you know, why would you put in a green screen floor and then force yourself to do post-production when you could probably pretty easily get a production design crew to come in and just build out your floor. I mean, of course, depending on the terrain, but that's going to sell a lot better and it's going to help bring together, you know, your imagery and, and, and sell the illusion. And Spencer, there was actually something that I was having a discussion with someone about these walls a little while ago and the, that question came up about you know, interacting with the floor or whatever. And then I said, the only, the, the, I guess the one challenge that you have to take into account when, from a scheduling standpoint is if you're relying on this wall for a bunch of elements, it's that change over time of like, okay, we're going to change from like the desert to like the subway car or something. And now you have to like remove the sandy floor and bring in the other floor or whatever. Cause you're obviously not going to move the wall. It's too big. So that's a factor that when you're creating things, you have to think of, you know, if we're putting real elements in, it's that change over time of switching from one place to the other, because the screen can change instantly, but the real elements have to be physically moved. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we also need to consider the fact that uh, one thing that makes it look real is how you blend the virtual world with a, you know, physical world. And I guess that would be something that we always wanted to test, but uh, I can't really say how we could actually see that works on a green mix of green and LED work, but that would be definitely challenging to, to change it like Jeremy said as well. The other thing to, to think about too is, and that's what we're looking at is, is the ceiling because you're leveraging the lighting as much as, well, it depends on what you're shooting, but you want to leverage the lighting as much as you can coming off the LEDs. Then if you're expanding out, don't forget the roof and the ceiling. And, you know, is that, you know, kind of what uh, you know Pixel's building with a full round and a ceiling a ceiling perspective to it is what is the lighting coming from above and do you want imagery up there or are you swapping that out yeah I'd almost say that you know putting ceilings on top is there is still an element of uncharted territory in terms of like what is the best solution at specific tiers um, I mean obviously the, the high uh, you know the the Mandalorians of the world are are doing that, so it's certainly something to consider with those resources. But there's a lot of lot you can achieve with traditional, you know, lights that are still aware of the virtual system, you know, with DMX protocols and the that connection into the engine. There's there's all kinds of control you can have over that, and you know, arguably you can do more with with your your uh, physical lighting setups because you can also like. You're, del you're splitting up the the work too. I mean, we've had really, really good collaborative experiences with uh, really experienced lighting technicians on 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 set um, that, that use the traditional film light setups, and that's just like nice to to like offload that responsibility to to that crew. And then you know the the VP team is is focusing on sort of like the other you know virtual production elements. And again, all at, at very specific tiers of of production. Awesome. Um, and so we've got uh, David asking. The scan that you just showed, Brendan, um, would that be usable in a volumetric stage? So can we, I know that was sort of previs material that you were showing off to plan out a height of a green screen on a, on, a, on a street, but can that scan specifically be brought into a stage and used in a, in a volumetric environment or what work would have to go into it to, to make that happen? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it's, it's a matter of, of how much time you want to put into it. You know, that, that scan is for us as artists is used as reference mostly, you know, you have, so this is where the point cloud tells me the wall is, I'm going to put a wall right there, right on top of it. Um, and then it's just, a, it really is a matter of how long do you need to create those assets? The stuff that you're seeing on, on Mandalorian and, and all that takes, it takes a long time to get those assets into final pixel shape. Um, I'll just show you again what, what we have. Uh, like th this is, you know, five days worth of work, I think to get it photo real looking, we're talking, you know, much, much more time, weeks and weeks of work to get it into a state where you can put the camera wherever you want. If that answers the question. 
the amazing thing with like lidar is it's a it's a form of reality capture and, and that's not the only form of reality capture there's also a process called photogrammetry uh, which is often used in combination with lidar yeah. so that's taking photos and and sort of reprojecting those textures onto laser data um, you know quixel mega scans is a really good example of photoreal assets it's the team that's gone around the world and captured you know amazing photoreal high quality assets that are photoreal that you can bring in and, and photograph against um, and that same technical process can be applied to, to, to buildings and full environments. Um, you know, as Brendan said, it is just how much time do you want to spend cleaning things up? There's certain things that are problematic that are really challenging to do with LIDAR and photogrammetry in general. Anything that's like super reflective is hard to deal with. So in a real world situation, when you're locate, location scouting and doing these captures, you know, there's going to be cars and vehicles and trees moving because of the wind. So that's all working against you. So, you know, that's, that has to go into sort of the capture process and, and you have to deal with that in, in post-production. I think where we're gonna, we're, we're already seeing is the building of uh, virtual asset libraries. Um, and, you know, and then from, uh, from a production, it's not only just for the content development, but it's for the marketing department, or, you know, you're seeing some of the bigger ones producing games off of, you know, live action content or, and that. So this spreading of these virtual assets across all aspects of delivery of a, content piece to the to the screen um that's a trend that's going to continue to to grow and grow so the accessibility for high level scans like quicksell and that it will will increase um and then when you take a look at if you're doing an episodic uh series you know be it you know for, uh, for netflix or even for the web the reuse of these assets um you know a common asset the spaceship you're going to reuse and reuse for you know, for the episodes that are, uh, you know, coming down the road. So that leveraging of that can really, could really reduce your price tag, especially for the longer the, the series goes. It's also this unknown sort of uh, element that uh, everyone's holding their breath for, for Unreal Engine 5 and, and just like what that might be able to support. Um, you know, these, these software co companies are recognizing, uh, you know, people want to be putting film quality assets and onto, you know, real-time renderers. So the, you know, if they can deliver on, on you know, what they're advertising, you know, there'll be some really amazing tools that are able to do what we need. Yeah, just, yeah, Spencer, 100%, like we're all holding our breath to see. I don't know if for those of you who haven't, don't know what we're talking about, Unreal Engine um, released this demo about six months ago of like a beautifully photoreal interactive environment, promising like a huge upgrade in the tech um, which is going to upend everything <laughs> that we do, um, you know, and we are hoping that it does deliver on the promise because it, that that's, a, you know, I hate to use the word game changer because it's such a cliche, but it really feels like it's going to be a big game changer in the way that, you know, we do virtual production, but also VFX, you know. It is growing so fast that some of the techniques that we master over the past few months is not going to be, you know, <laughs> we have to just like a bottom and that's it. We've, we've been working on yeah. some techniques and workflows, which is so, interesting. Yeah. I think it's great. To yeah, there, there is that element of like, you know, we built it all from scratch. I know everybody here like built it themselves from scratch, but in like two months, someone's going to release something that's like, oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> it's all in one package that took me months and months to do. <laughs> I think that that speaks to obviously um, the amazing history we've all, uh, the entire industry has gone through. Like, and, and um, I think a lot of great uh, minds within the space are constantly referred back to like film's origins and playing tricks with the camera, like putting real set pieces, lighting them perfectly up um, to try and compose that image um, and viewing it from that standpoint. It's like, we're, we are just going back towards um, telling the story from the lens and what we can put in front of it to get that story where we want it to be um, and how we can achieve that, like going to New Zealand on a budget. Um, we got another question coming in. So Josh is asking, uh, how does the maximum brightness of the screen dictate the way you light around the foreground elements? So how do you light with the screen and in the foreground, reality and mixed reality? Maybe someone else can answer in terms of like the secondary part, but I also just wanted to mention just like what kind of control we have and how you can like use that to your advantage or disadvantage. So like there's a lot of different levels and things that you can control to, to that contribute to that. And there's like the screen brightness from zero to 100% uh, of the displays themselves. And then secondary to that, there's also 
the control within the virtual production engine again exposure zero to whatever and you know color correction and all that kind of stuff so yeah there's just like different areas that you can use to to control um, i think when we shot that demo that we uh, shot yesterday with carl our screen brightness was set to nine percent brightness um so i mean we weren't even anywhere near the <laughs> the ceiling on on display brightness yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience um, because I know obviously I was I was tuning in via Zoom, but there would, we'd always like line up the first shot and be like, okay, something's off, and 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 I I can at least speak to from a cinematographer's perspective. You've now got like not only is it just you're you're keeping mental track of all your panels in play, like every light you have on your set. It's also like, wait a minute, can you adjust the screen brightness for a second? It's like you dial it down. It's like, oh, okay, now it matches. Now now it now it looks real. Um, so you're you're kind of almost currently. Um, doubling your environmental set where uh, the workflow from a cinematography perspective is like, do you light based on your virtual environment and swing that into reality? Or do you light reality and then and then match it in your virtual environment? And I know we did a, we did quite a dance yesterday <laughs> to, to get that all lined up uh, via Zoom. Um, we've got another question. Uh, Andrew is asking, uh, from the perspective of a DIT, so digital imaging technician, um, how can a DIT prep for the following challenges, working with an LED display, a wall array, you know, black and white point, color temperature, light emission of the LEDs, basically um, sp speaking to it very, very technically minded on the actual color rendition uh, of the wall itself versus what we're used to capturing in the environment. Um, what can DITs plan for? Well, basically, uh, I, I might not be able to answer that in a technical way, but I'll just wanted to add is that was one of the challenges that we have. And we know from the producing point of view that the DID's role on the set would be even more important. Uh, and I guess uh, that will include uh, the knowledge of the gaming engine as well, because moving forward, I think a lot of uh, balances, a lot of, uh, like you mentioned, lighting, creating shadows and uh, creating uh, some sort of a diverse lighting mood and set would be done through the engine. And uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Spencer, there are already like uh, applications in place for that. Like, you know, uh, so I think that, that, but yeah, definitely, I guess the IT's uh, role is going to change. Uh, I've, I've, and I think it's for the best, to be honest. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion is, is yeah, being aware of what capabilities you, you might have color wise in, in the engine. Um, you know, there's a few key, key areas that um, like actual elements in the engine that you can start to explore properties and just like understand what the game engine terminology is. And then, you know, through testing, translate that to terminology that's used on, on set. Um, and another element uh, you could also look at is the, uh, the processors of, of the, that power these like large format displays. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple hardware vendors out there that provide the imaging hardware that actually sends the rendered images to the displays and then the displays themselves also have different capabilities. So, so there's, you're starting to get into some precision level, you know, technical understanding, but that's all information out there that you could start to inquire and, and, and learn about. And I guess, I guess, I mean, it, something I hadn't really thought of until that question was asked, but there's, there's now that, uh, that potential of tying in the DIT with the person who's controlling the walls. So you're now, you're, if you're live grading, you're like live grading the camera feed, but you also want to tweak like, oh, let's make the background a little more cyan or you're, you're now like color correcting that background slightly in real time while you're actually, you know, live grading your camera feed. So you're kind of melding those two things together in an interesting way. I think Everybody, everybody's joining into Video Village then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think People it's all... <laughs> Well, one, I mean, one thing that I've seen, like from having watched the Mandalorian demos and, and getting a sense of this, because I haven't shot with a wall like this myself directly, but the thing I often think about is like, how do you, like, let's say you've got a scene that's like bright desert, sunny day, and you want to like have hard sun pounding in because your subject needs to be lit with hard sun. I, you know, and it's coming from above or behind, you know, that to me is a challenge where, you know, it's harder to control hard sun sources because right now typically they're hmis which you can't dmx dim as easily as say like a sky panel or something like that so to me that if i was to approach that that would be a challenge that i would have to figure out how to achieve or address because hard sun interaction and matching to whatever the wall is doing to me would be one of the harder things to to make look real 
Well, I think another thing from our experience is like the, the LED walls are part of the set and also they are the start of your virtual world. So it's really hard to define it at some point. It's just, well, you're going to, how do you want to treat it? How are you going to cast a light on it? How do you want to get that much reflection out of it? And I think these are all going to fall under the ITs moving forward with, you know, with the right. new way of working. Yeah, Carl, as, as far sorry, as you guys assert, how have you, how have you dealt with that yet? That, that kind of interactivity of, of hard light with with the wall. Yeah, we we've done some some testing um, with that. Um, you know, before we even are able to, you know, solve that aspect, we're hitting other challenges. <laughs> so it's 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 uh yeah, it's difficult. I mean, to, to elaborate on it specifically with the current displays we have, um, they're um, a little bit of an older model, so they don't have the matte black finish in in between the LED. So, so using extremely hard sources, um, you know, you, we get a lot of sort of spill and reflections on, on the wall, on the wall. So it's, yeah, it's just really dealing with all the different, different elements. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I think this, this sort of goes into something, um, that virtual production as an ecosystem, as a, a bunch of people, you know, sort of, uh, tinkering and, and fixing ways experiencing is like, it can get, exceptionally technical. Like we're, we're talking about um, LED pitch, we're talking about color processing, DPI, like DIT, color space integration with virtual worlds and real worlds is like suddenly, um, yes, we've, we've made the entire world come to us on a stage, but also we've doubled the entire workflow. Um, I actually want to toss this question to you, Yasmin. From a director's perspective, how do you see all these technical aspects sort of fitting into a creative workflow for you? It, it, engaging a new project in the future um, for, you know, in using virtual production technology, whether it's in previs or in production. Um, what, what's your sort of directorial viewpoint on, on virtual production? Um, I think it, that's interesting because I think, you know, there's when you're a director, you're, you know, working with a DP, you're working with a production designer to kind of create a set. Um, I think what's interesting about virtual production is you're first working with someone like Spencer, um, who's kind of creating a set on this background, but then you're also, you have like almost like another separate workflow where you're working with a production designer and a DP to create a practical set that's like in front of mm -hmm. like the, the virtual background environment. Um, so in terms of workflow, I think it's interesting because I think there's sort of like there's two separate workflows that you're going through, but you're also trying to like merge them together to make sure that everything like flows seamlessly. Um, but there's sort of I guess there's two, two teams in that sense, which is like your production design and your lighting that's on the background versus your production design and lighting that's going on in like the practical real world, like all the stuff that's in front of a screen that's like your actors are interacting with um, and stuff like that. Without would, over <laughs> uh, simplifying it, when you approached uh, the project that you shot on the stage, um, which one did you tackle first? Did you tackle reality or did you ta tackle like in-engine reality? Um, honestly, I think we, for, for us, for specifically for us, because we were going, we're I guess like because the environment itself was changing so much um, because we were going from day to night, we really, we, we started, I think with um, like the virtual background first um, and kind of mapping what that looks like. And then kind of Dennis DP came in, we had a production designer come in and sort of create, you know, some foreground elements that um, Ren could sit on. And then Dennis would come in to sort of, match the lighting to our virtual production environment and then also then then we when we get camera set up then you sort of can sort of like make adjustments to like the grade and exposure and stuff to see what it looks actually looks like in camera um so i guess to answer your question i think i think for us specifically we started with the virtual production environment and then we sort of matched the other other elements to that environment I mean, moving forward, I would love to see those like areas converge like more than they already already are. Um, you know, like when you're developing virtual environments, it's 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 great to have a team that knows 
or, or like is, is con obviously contributing to what the practical elements are going to be. And then as soon as you start to bring in these reality capture elements too, then, you know, that's, that's great sort of like fuel to, to, you know, capture physical elements and uh, as the foundation for your virtual stuff. So I think the more that those teams sort of converge and are communicating with each other, the easier the process like sort of like is down the road. And this sort of ties back into stuff that Brendan was saying of, of there's so much you can do in engine and, you know, the technicians are just really, really in it with the technical stuff. So like if we can start to understand, you know, better what, you know, DOPs want to achieve, then um, we can sort of like puzzle piece together solutions and provide options and deliver on, on features. There's, there's really just too much for, and like, you know, DOPs don't necessarily know what can be achieved, right? So if we know what the vision is, then we could be like, oh, well, this could be a solution or that could be a solution. So bringing it in earlier is, is always a appeal to me. And to that, I guess also, you know, it improves the communication between the head of departments on the set, which is something that we found very interesting. Uh, uh, you know, it improves the, the, the performer's ability to react, to work with the moving objects to, to the environment it improves the set designer and DOPs, the conversations are more like uh, spot on. Like if they want to change anything immediately, that helps. And that was something that we didn't experience in the more traditional ways to, to dispense this point. Awesome. And this actually ties in really well with a question we got from Andrew, um, which is a little technical, but I it, essentially to boil it down, um, what he's asking is, when we bring physical elements into a game environment, so volumetrically capturing actual objects, bringing them onto the stage, and then representing them in engine so that they can occlude or affect the lighting in virtual space versus reality, um, how do we go about doing that? Like, what, what process do we start with? Do we start with the rendered object in a game engine? and then create a physical object to match? Or do we start with the physical object and then scan it and toss it in game engine? Is there anyone that can speak to an experience having done that? I guess uh, I, 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 I wish our DOP Sasha was here to show some light on that, but I just want to uh, say an experience that we had on, on the set because we had one of our set in the, in the demo, we had a bridge and then we wanted to basically create that bridge. It doesn't exist in the real world, but obviously the shadow of the bridge would be on the actual physical set because we don't really need to have the bridge. And that was one of the key moments that we realized like, okay, how are we going to do that? Because, you know, like uh, Brandon was showing that we could actually change the position of the song and then we could see the bridge in the virtual world, but continuing the shadow in the physical world, that was the challenge for us. And what we did if, uh, just uh, in what, from what I remember was basically doing both. So we were started building out the shadow initially, which is really hard to building those shadow in front of the massive source of light that you have in the studio and then gradually change the light virtually. So I guess it's kind of both ways. Like again, like uh, I don't want to get into the technicals that I'm not necessarily uh, the, know much of, but I think in terms of the workflow, it was something that the both sides could definitely work together to kill that. I think both of those approaches are completely suitable that you identified, Carl. Um, I think like the way I would look at it is that like, just because we're doing virtual production, whether it's in-camera VFX or fully virtual, sort of more of a previous style, um, um, or even just for final output, but fully virtual, is that there's still like that previs component to it um, and it's important that people don't don't forget that um, when we do in-camera VFX with the LED volumes um, I would even say it's even like more critical like uh, you, I mean our experience with constructing that demo was was there were some challenges there of, of you had a vision of where you wanted the camera within the environment and you know be, I mean, partly those challenges were because you were remote but but you know they still apply even if we we're in the same same building as like well you know is, is this is the camera in the right spot virtually and if it's not like why is it not and what is what is affecting that perception um you know there was i guess something we didn't really uh go into because it was too technical but one of the challenges we had creating the demo was um uh, the scale of our environment uh, we had an expectation of how much you know camera movement we should perceive on the screen and that was just not there because our mocap mocap system was at a different sort of scale so we could tweak things to to 
to, to get things looking right. But I guess the essence of it is like, how do you pre vis for these kinds of shoes? And that was, those answers are still sort of like, you know, emerging. Awesome. There's another, there's another actually thing that I've, I, it's come up in discussions when I've asked people about this or, or thought about it, um, you know, because obviously one of the great things about this is the time saving aspect of being able to change backgrounds quickly uh, and, you know, your environment, but then bringing this into like an episodic television world, we're almost always required to shoot with, you know, two cameras to get our days. And I know that that's one element that there's a limitation or challenge with these uh, walls is how do you shoot with two cameras at the same time? Of the of the action, if there's movement. Sorry, could you just repeat the last bit? I got a little bit distracted. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say, like, how how, what are the ways, or because I'm not even I'm not familiar with how this would work technically, but how would you use? I know the cameras are tracking to the screen, so if you wanted to have two cameras on the shot and they're both moving. Obviously, you're you're seeing different parts of the screen. Can you window different parts of the screen and say this part is moving for, for a camera, this part's moving for B, and making sure they don't overlap so you don't see the two moving backgrounds happening? Yeah, I mean that would basically be it. Like you, they just can't overlap. If they do overlap, one would take priority, or you could have some functionality to switch between the the two. So you know you can identify as one camera as your main camera, so that you know when that one if it happens to overlap, you know for sure you're getting that one. Um, but yeah, you could certainly have both on, on screen uh, rendering if you have the the render the GPU rendering resources. Uh, I guess that yeah, that I mean that was a great segue from the previous thing because that's definitely something you would want to have a concept of, right? I mean, you wouldn't want both cameras in there with both capabilities all working and then discovering oh, most of the shots we want to get are overlapping. So like, why are we even trying this, right? So you can mm -hmm. definitely plan those those shots out and sort of like almost ensure in a way that you know you aren't going to have overlapping backgrounds. Yeah, I think um, just to, just to speak to your question a bit, Jeremy, about like where does it fit into um, the episodic environment? Um, a different school of thought that I've heard put out there, which I actually, um, you know, I've talked to people who uh, is they, they don't want this technology to like really move forward because it eliminates like on location shooting or will change the format of the way we shoot. We'll bring everything back to studios, um, and people that really really want to succeed and, and are pushing that technology forward. Um, one one nice middle ground I've heard it like sort of referenced in is like how we'll see this technology used in the future is possibly at every stage or at least in every major film hub there will be a stage in that city where your second unit and your pickups and um, everything you weren't able to capture on the day when you're getting the meat of the scene if you will when you're capturing your close-ups capturing your masters um, if you need a punch in on an object or you just need um, someone walking down a hallway, normally second unit sort of uh, kind of has to work around main unit where what set they're shooting on in the stage, what actors they're using at that time. And I can see virtual production uh, and this workflow really fitting into that environment where it's like, okay, we just put them on the volume. We can re-render the entire environment because we already have a scan of that. And then we just get the close-up we need. Um, I also, yeah, I also think that there's like, um, like, I mean, there's a huge element of like picking the right tool for the right job. I mean, like no one's trying to shove virtual production down everyone's throats. Um, you, you gotta, you gotta like, yeah, figure out the right, there's going to be situations where it's like, yeah, let's just go down the street and rent that building. Of course. Right? I mean, why, why would you, uh, 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 use virtual production for everything, but, um, I am trying to shove virtual production <laughs> down everybody's throats. Okay. Spencer. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> Jeremy can attest to that. Sure. <laughs> I mean, we're starting to see with some productions that, I mean, they're still doing their, their studio builds and, and shooting, um, you know, practically, but then they also have the VP stage for very specific stuff. And, uh, and I mean, I, I love what Brendan was, was talking about at the beginning with just like the fact that you can go into these environments and really play and really figure things out. Yeah. And I, I really wanted to interject that like, you know, that's, that's what these, these environments are. They're, they're immersive environments and complete sets. So if you have that capacity to play, like that's where you can like really figure out and be collaborative and creative with, with directors, right? Yeah, that's, you know, that's something that- It also might mean that you can, you can actually decide how much you need to build. If you're yeah. able to, if you go into an environment and you play around, you're like, okay, we actually need to build three feet of this thing. And then everything else is, is gonna be blue screen, you know? So that, that, I think that's also a great tool for that. Yeah, we, I, can't, I can't say the show and I can't say what we did. So this is gonna seem very vague, but we had a, a blue screen environment and we pre out the whole thing um, using the final environment, previous version of it, an Unreal Engine version of it, 
And then uh, once we were happy with it, we just plunked the blue screen on over top and then we could assess where we had coverage, where we had slips in coverage. But um, further to your other point is that, is that it, you know, we could indulge our curiosity, which I think is the really for, for you know, directors is really key that you, um, you know, there's how often are directors on set, we got 150 people looking at you being like, okay, now what? You don't have time to try things out then, right? But in this sort of environment, you can try it out at absolutely no cost. It takes two seconds, right? So that's for me has been my aha moment with virtual production is just that you can, you know, whatever you can think of, you can do in there and at yeah, no and cost. I think, I think it open up, opens up a lot of possibilities too, like even in terms of ideas. Like I remember the first time visiting the search place, you guys showed us a demo of, um, there was a woman who like jumped across the subway tunnel and like leaned against the wall and the subway went past her, which is something that, you know, normally like as a director, I wouldn't write and just write in a music video dream because it's like, well, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do that with the budget I have, right? But like with virtual production, it's like, oh, if I if I did want to do something like that's like, oh, maybe I can write it in and sort of create it virtually rather than uh, putting someone in, in harm's way. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a huge part of what Amir is like try, trying to facilitate, right? Mm -hmm. to oh, empower people. And it's also yeah. really cheap to, to try the, that out and, and quickly and easily and be like, eh, this isn't going to work, you know? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the acceleration that's, that's happening now, right? As more creatives get in to, to play or try the technology, and I think we're at a basis now that they can. And so this acceleration over the next couple of years is going to be insane because, the, you know, with that Epic's push and also other technologies coming in to, to integrate the VR environment is going to accelerate so that you can, as we always say, it's, it's the technology is there to extend your creative vision, right? It's not the other way around. Um, and so it's going to be an interesting ride and we haven't even touched artificial intelligence, which at the cert center was trying to figure out how that's going to play a role. Um, and then, um, and then the continuation of, you know, of GPU power and, and rendering power is, is pretty insane. Mm -hmm. I think there's another thing that a lot of people look at all these amazing examples like the Mandalorian and all that, and they were like, wow, this is going to be expensive. I don't think you really need a lot of budget to try, like Brandon said, it's, it's easy. It's just there are a lot of uh, options at CERT and other organizations that they could actually use. There are a lot of different ways that they could actually do it in their own garage, I guess. It's not a, you know, testing it, getting to that point to understand how it works. I don't think that's going to cost a lot of money for anyone. Awesome. Um, well, uh, because we're coming to the end of our panel, I have one more question for everyone. Um, and, and I want everyone to sort of speak to their own experience, whether or not it's like their own personal experience or what they see for the industry at large. But it, I want you guys to talk about the future. So whether or not you have a project on the horizon you can talk about that you're using this technology for, or if you want to give a broad-based viewpoint of where you think this technology is going to take the film industry and specifically the Canadian film industry moving forward, can you guys, each of you, speak about where do you see virtual production technology going? Uh, and we will start with Jeremy. Just unmute myself there. Um, I mean, I, having had my eyes open to it with what Brendan has going on at his space, I think, I feel like I'm going to see using it more, at least for me right away, as a, as a previous tool rather than the virtual wall tool. Uh, I mean, I think eventually I'll get into that virtual wall world, but I think in the immediate future, it's going to be the previous aspect and the, you know, coming up with ideas and possibly even using uh, the technology to have uh, tie-ins of like previses of comps. So if you're in a state at a set build that's partially blue screen with a real element and you're trying to figure out, okay, how much light is coming from the thing I can't see yet. And I want to get a sense of like, what is it going to look like once it's all comped together? And I want to move the camera and see what's happening in the background. To me, it's kind of like the hybrid of the two worlds where it's, it's not a necessarily a video wall per se, but it's, it's a, it's a live comp of what's going to become the real thing so there's a there's like an unreal engine background being comped into a real thing and we're moving the camera we're using the blue screen as a way to kind of tie it in and at least we can see it i can match my lighting to a thing that i doesn't exist yet because i see 
that is a thing that would be a huge tool to help us get our, our light matching what's going to be put in later. So that's what I see is my initial use of it. And I'm sure it'll become more the wall technology, but that's, that's sort of my take on it. Awesome. Uh, Amir, what's coming next? Uh, sure. I think, uh, honestly, I think this is going to have a very positive impact on the Canadian film landscape. I guess it's going to create more jobs, going to create more positions on the film set. We will have much younger people from different diverse backgrounds that are not necessarily film. They're going to be involved in the production of the content. Uh, and also, I think that's going to give much broader creative freedom, like Jasmine was saying, to, to the Canadian filmmakers to think and, well, eventually maybe we're gonna have our own set up dramas and work done in this space rather than, as you know, they're already building the biggest virtual production space in Toronto. So I guess uh, that's gonna affect everything in the production landscape. Amazing. Spencer, where are things going for you? Yeah, I'd love to see like um, just like the different kinds of content that are being made with these with these tools. Um, you know, like when you get into these immersive environments and everything is real time, and you start to get closer to that final pixel um, achievement where you can really reduce your post production time. Um, you know, people are going to spend a lot more time uh, collaborating and being creative in the spaces. So it, I think that's going to have a, a trickle down sort of effect on on what. The content is being generated um you know I, <laughs> as you start to get more sort of like performance-based technology support so like things like performance capture and mocap like and facial animation like you could have virtual characters that are also in these experiences like we're not just we don't ne necessarily just have to be photographing on on virtual backgrounds for environmental purposes you could have live action people communicating and and doing a scene with with virtual characters on, on these these led walls as well um, and then because it's all real time, it could, it could be structured as a sort of an improvised thing. I mean, a lot of people love those like imp improvisational comedies that, that, you know, they, they, they shoot there. So it's going to have an impact on the type of content for sure. Amazing. I, yeah, I love the virtual character aspect to it. Um, Brendan, yourself, Mavericks, where is virtual production taking you guys? Yeah, I don't know yet. Um, we're, we have been employing it um, as a problem solving tool. Um, and I, I, I'm at that stage where like, how did we do this before? For example, like in Ontario, we've got a, a, a rule for the film industry that you can only have 10 people uh, in front of camera right now because of COVID. So we've actually had a few sessions with a, a few productions saying, okay, well, what does 10 people look like on camera? And then, and it has modified how they're actually going to shoot the scene because they're able to see and move people around and move blocking things, trucks, buses, whatever it is around and still realize that's not enough. So they actually, you know, we were in a session where they modified their entire approach to the scene. And, and that, that part has been essential. And I, I can foresee productions using it as a planning tool not the big flashy stuff, just like, you know, 10 people, here's the space, what does it look like? Um, and, and overall, I, I, you know, as I mentioned before, I think Unreal 5 is, is, gonna, is gonna blow the doors off everything and we're gonna have to sort of reassess what it looks like. But what I have absolutely loved is Epic Games' approach to this. And the mega grants is something that's so smart as a business tool. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, they have, I don't know, it's a hundred million dollar fund or something. And you just pitch to them an idea that you have. It can be a creative short, it can be a creative film, it can be an art project, it can be tech, it can be whatever. And what they're doing is they're just, people are coming up with ideas that they're gonna add to the engine to make it better. And then, and then uh, Epic pays for that. So it's a democratization of it. So it's not just the people at the top, you know, your, your ILMs and Disney's who are dictating where this goes. It's everybody across the entire industry, which is so exciting. So it, it, it empowers everybody. So nobody can actually say where it's going to go because there's going to be someone, you know, in, you know, Gimli, Manitoba, who's got this great idea and it's going to change the course of, of what we're doing. So that's, that's what I love. I, and I love that I have no idea where it's going. 
Awesome. I love that perspective. And, and uh, I'll even add to that and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of stealing this from another amazing panel discussion that I witnessed uh, in virtual reality. But I actually, I love the idea that it could be someone sitting in our audience right now who's listening to this, who right. will lead that next great step forward uh, in virtual production. And it is open and democratized to everyone. Like there is no set standard. Um, you know, we're not building sensors here. You can, anyone out there can push this forward in one way or another, whether it's creative or technologically. Um, David, Sir, where are you guys taking virtual production? Oh, you don't want to know. Um, the and I'm going to go off of what Brandon said is is I think a thank you to Epic Games, you know, and thank you all the Fortnite players out there, because <laughs> uh, it is really this is a this is a significant change in content creation. Period. So everybody's jumping in. You know, the, you got the front runners, of course, and now the masses are jumping in. So we're going to see so much creativeness coming to leveraging uh, virtual production and the content screening created. It's going to be a snowball effect. The second is, you know, with COVID and sort of our focus there, collaboration, distant, distance collaboration is happening where, you know, like the person from Manitoba can tap into us and we can engage with it and, more, and also outside of Canada. So all, you know, the, the, the different cultures and different countries and experiences that people have in creating content is going to bring it together more and leveraging the game engine and leveraging virtual production. And then I guess the final piece is, um, it's kind of what we've talked about and sort of the areas we're working in. All, everything's coming together, live performances, uh, film and television, gaming, it's all coming together in, into this one sort of uh, production epicenter so that um, that we're seeing of the work we're doing with the National Ballet and, and the Canadian Opera Company is producing content pieces there that's going to be delivered um, through different, uh, different screens. So you're bringing those creatives into this picture and it's really, really cool to, to, to see this, this advancement and the use of technology and bringing all the creatives together no matter where they are, not just film and television. Amazing. And finally, Yasmin, as a director, as a creative, where do you see this technology going and will you use it in the future? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm interested to see like how other creatives like use the screens. I think one thing in the demo that was really interesting was that um, in terms of like the LED screens at CERT, they're actually, you can actually configure them, like customize your configuration of, of the screens. So, It'd be interesting to see, um, you know, if, if hypothetically you could create like a 360 room, you know, and do more, sort of more 360 things like within the space as well, instead of just sort of like shooting in one plane, hypothetically speaking. Um, so yeah, I'm just interested really to see where where it goes and creative ways of how people use, uh, use the technology. Awesome. Well, that concludes our panel. Thank you all of you for sharing your time with us on this amazing Sunday to share your experience and your perspective on where virtual production is going. I can definitely speak to the, the CSC perspective, at least building out this panel. I learned so much about this technology uh, and I don't think this is the last time we're gonna talk about it. Um, I think in the future, we'll see a lot more aspects of it, different elements working into the process for cinematographers and directors and producers uh, and ca Canadian creatives. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in and listening to us share our experience. Uh, this recording will be available on the CSC YouTube page to play at any point, share around afterwards. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. That was fun. Thank right. you, Carl. Thanks. See ya. Thank you.